Welcome everyone to Disaster Prep and Recovery for Nonprofits and Libraries, Using Technology. We are glad to have you joining us for today's TechSoup webinar. Before we get started, I would like to make sure everyone is comfortable using ReadyTalk, the webinar platform we are on today. Feel free to chat your questions in using the box on the lower left side of your screen at any time. No need to raise your hand. We will be here to flag those questions, help you with any technical difficulties, and get those questions queued up for our presenter during the webinar. We will keep all lines muted so you get a clear recording to refer to later and share with your friends and colleagues. Most of you are hearing the audio play through your computer speakers, so if you are hearing an echo, you may be logged in more than once and will need to close additional instances of ReadyTalk. If at any time the audio stream doesn't work for you, or goes in and out, or falls out of sync with the slides, we recommend dialing in using the alternate toll-free number that Susan just chatted out in the window. If you lose your Internet connection, go ahead and reconnect using that green Join Meeting button that you got in your confirmation or reminder emails. And you can also reach out to ReadyTalk support directly at 800-843-9166 if you need any additional assistance. You are being recorded today. And we say that just so that you will know that you can look for today's webinar in our archives, along with the upcoming list and calendar of webinars at TechSoup.org slash community slash events dash webinars. You can also watch it on our TechSoup YouTube channel at TechSoup Video. Within a few days you will get the full recording of today's presentation including links that we discuss and the resources. For those of you who registered just this morning, you probably are able to access the uh, download of today's presentation on the right side of your screen in that confirmation email. For those of you who got a reminder email from me an hour ago, you will also be able to download those files. And this is where you will look for that in the follow-up email if you need to access those uh, files and want to print them out, follow along with us today. We have a lot of content to cover in an hour, and I imagine we may not get to everything that's in that slide deck. So we wanted to include it anyway so that it's there for you as a resource. And this is that green Join Meeting button if for any reason you get kicked out or have trouble viewing the screen. You can always close out of ReadyTalk and rejoin. It's no trouble to us to have you do that, and it may resolve your problem if you're having technical difficulties. My name is Becky Wiegand, and I'm the Webinar Program Manager here at TechSoup. And I am happy to be your host today. I'm joined by Lars Eric Holm, who is the Disaster Preparedness Coordinator at Eden INR, which is a nonprofit that provides 211 service, linking Alameda County, California families and individuals to community resources, referrals, information, and services throughout the community. I know Lars Eric uh, from going way back probably six or seven years. When uh, before joining Eden INR, he was the lead community educator and IT specialist at CARD, coordinating, or I'm sorry, I think it's collaborating agencies responding to disasters. Correct me if I'm wrong there, Lars Eric. And they are a nonprofit in Oakland, California that had worked on addressing emergency preparedness and disaster response needs of service providers. So they helped make sure that the providers of services to communities had their disaster preparedness plans and response plans in check and ready to go so that no matter what kind of disaster struck, people were prepared to respond and support their communities. He's conducted trainings for a diverse range of communities uh, including children to seniors, visually impaired, and deaf and hard of hearing. We're really glad to have him as our expert presenter today. You'll also see assisting in the chat Susan Hope Bard from TechSoup. She's our Training and Education Manager. And you'll see Sarah Finnegan who's joining us from Eden INR as their Deputy Director. So thank you to both of you for helping on the back end. Looking at our objectives for today, we hope that you'll come away from today's event and will have learned some about 211 and other already existing technology resources to help you support your community, whatever kind of community that is, in an emergency or disaster. We hope that you will be able to consider whether your organization has already got a good setup for your backup, your power, literal power like your ability to power on devices and technology in an emergency, and communication strategies to help plan ahead of any disaster. And we hope that you'll discover some types of mobile apps available that will provide support and response during any emergency. And you know, for the sake of today's event, we really are defining emergency or disaster pretty broadly. In, in TechSoup's mind, an emergency can be um, 
it floods in your office and your server gets rained on. It can be uh, a former employee maybe maliciously attacking your technology. That probably doesn't happen too much, but it is the kind of disaster you want to make sure that you are prepared for. It can be a major catastrophe like a hurricane or a tornado, um, a natural disaster. It could be, um, you know, there are so many different varieties of, of things that can happen, and we want to make sure that you are not afraid to move forward with steps today that can help you better respond and be prepared ahead of time so that you can continue to be a resilient organization, whether you are a library, a church, whether you are a nonprofit, um, that whatever community is that you connect with or serve, that you are able to support them and keep your staff and, and people in your office safe and connected. So before we get into the topic at hand, a little bit about TechSoup. We are a nonprofit. 501c3, and we've been around since 1987. And we now serve every place in the world on this map that is blue, which is almost all of the world, 236 countries. If you're joining us from outside the United States, I recommend visiting our TechSoup.Global site. But go ahead and chat in to let us know from where you're joining us today. Susan and I are based in our San Francisco headquarters here. And I believe Lars Eric is in the East Bay today, maybe Hayward. Uh, we've got people chiming in from all over the place. So thank you so much for joining us. We may mention some resources and products or, or tools that may only be available to organizations in the United States. So like I said, if you are from outside the U.S., I recommend checking out TechSoup.Global and selecting your country from the drop-down to learn what different resources may be available and donated to organizations in your country. With that, I'd like to go ahead and hand it over to Lars Eric to take us through some of his disaster prep and recovery for nonprofits or libraries. Thanks so much for joining us today, Lars Eric. We're really glad to have you. Becky, everyone, thank you very, very much. Um, so just uh, as Becky indicated, these, this slide deck is meant to be a resource. So I'm going to be moving fairly quickly through things because part of the idea is that you guys will have this slide deck to then look at uh, at your leisure in more detail uh, to look things up. Um, also, I'll have complete contact information at the very end. Um, so please do feel free to reach out to me. Um, email is a great way to reach me, for example, um, for any questions you might have. Uh, first, just a really quick – hold on here – just a really quick little bit about my background. In a sense, I was born um, to have my current career and my current calling. I grew up in Alaska um, where I learned a Yupik phrase which basically translate as always getting ready. When you grow up in a rural place like Alaska, you're really um, comfortable with the idea of how um, it's important to just always be ready to deal with any kind of a situation that might happen on your own. Um, I worked um, for a number of years for a company that made backup software. So I lived and breathed backup for quite some time. Um, as Becky mentioned, I was the lead community educator and IT specialist for collaborating agencies responding to disasters. Um, our focus was on helping nonprofits prepare to prosper. Um, I am now under uh, working for Eden INR as a disaster preparedness coordinator. But because Eden INR was one of the co-founders of CARD, um, I'm actually able to offer CARD's innovative curriculum uh, for free, actually, which is great, within Alameda County, um, for um, in, uh, for nonprofits. Um, that being said, you know, for those of you who are outside of Alameda County, outside California, or even outside the United States, please don't hesitate to contact us because um, CARD especially and Eden I and R and 211s all do like to reach out to each other. I am, in fact, a little bit of a preparedness geek, as you can see from one of my favorite mugs. Okay, so Eden I and R, just a little bit about us. We have been successfully linking people and resources for 40 years. Um, we are the centralized resource for health, housing, and community resources in Alameda County. Do know that 2 one is in fact a national program. Um, one of our primary um, functions for the past 10 years has been to be the folks who answer at the other end of the line when you call 2 one asking for help. Um, and when you call within Alameda County, you get us. Um, why would you call 2 one in general? It's because it is a free, 24-7, multilingual, completely confidential phone number. Um, and you can actually get any kind of community resources in everyday life, as well as before, during, or after a disaster. We constantly are vetting and verifying our resources. Um, 
we basically help people with a wide variety of issues. Legal referrals, we're getting a bit of a spike in things about having to do with immigration law, for example. Um, counseling services, housing, family support. We partner with organizations like First Five um, and so forth. And the most important thing about this is that we actually provide in-depth assessments. When you call 211 for help, we don't just say, oh, let me look that up for you. We actually ask some questions, again, as I said, completely confidential, to guide you not just towards the things that you're asking for, but also for the resources that you actually need. So sometimes when people call looking for housing, we may find during the assessment that they also have a need for food or for childcare or for counseling or for employment opportunities. So it's actually a much bigger picture. It's a holistic, um, compassionate ear that you get on the other end of the line when you call 211. Um, one of my favorite quotes is from an author named Neil Gaiman, who once noted that Google can bring you back 100,000 answers, but it takes a librarian to bring you back the right one. Eden INR is that librarian for any kind of health, housing, and human resources. In a disaster, we're the number you would call. If it's life-threatening, if you have to have something out there, you obviously would call 911. But it's really, really critical to note that you want to actually uh, be able to reach um, uh, information without tying up the lines for 911. Um, so we would be giving you all kinds of news and updates on health advisories, for example. Should you evacuate or not? Where, where can you find food, water, or shelters? It's also important to know that we have a very important role post-disaster. Um, those of you may have seen the news about the San Jose floods, and we actually have a roving specialist who, despite the fact that it's in San Jose, which is outside of Alameda County, we have one of the uh, top housing databases in the country. Um, and um, even though it's focused on Alameda County, a lot of folks still need some housing opportunities, plus we're advocating with landlords on uh, trying to help people find housing now they've been flooded out. So life-threatening emergencies, you obviously still call 911, but everything else you call 211. And that's national across the United States. Um, outside the country, um, I'd be actually interested in hearing from some of you folks um, where um, some of these um, uh, similar services might reside. So we're basically the number to call. That's, that's really the essential, essential, uh, essential takeaway from this. Keep in mind, too, that we are extremely active in disaster preparedness. We constantly participate in drills. We're constantly making sure that we're available in, in, in times of crisis. We have our own backup and preparedness efforts, which is one reason why we can talk very intelligibly about this, because we have to make sure that we're prepared to be here to serve the community. Now, keep in mind that you know, a lot of the people we focus you know, youth, non-English speakers, domestic violence, disabled, homeless. And we actually also will uh, help people, human service agencies who are themselves seeking service on behalf of their clients. So it's entirely possible that you actually might call 211 on behalf of someone. And it's really important, especially during an emergency, because we can actually help steer people in proper directions. And that actually leaves other agencies free to respond in the ways that they can do most efficiently. Uh, here are a couple of slides that I have borrowed from my time at CARD. And we'll just take a short moment to look at this. You'll see that there's basically a whole group of people who often get labeled as having issues. Seniors, low income, single parents, deaf, hard of hearing, special needs that have emerged because of disaster, homeless, chemically dependent. I mean, there's so many ways that we can label people. You can see we actually had to cram two slides worth of it. You know, people who are fearful of governmental agencies, perhaps people who are, in fact, um, re-entry out of the system, the developmentally disabled, people who are transients. Pets or animals are often a very big issue. Culture is a huge, huge issue during this. So what I'd like to do now is this is a point where we'd actually do a quick poll. Please indicate if you have any of the people listed on these prior slides are clients that serve by your work. Yep, go ahead and check off. Uh, click that radio button on screen that whether you are uh, helping people who are listed on those slides. And it may be that you have a, a house of worship where people come, and those are folks that may be on some of those lists. It might be that you run a community center or an animal shelter or any other type of nonprofit. You may be an education nonprofit where you do policy and advocacy, and so maybe you don't have direct service to people, but maybe the issues you touch on serve people in, in those lists. So take a second, and we'll go ahead and share the results here in just a moment. The great majority of the people on the line today are serving people who are on that list. 
or on either of those lists. So it really does uh, touch everybody almost. Um, one other question we want to ask and get an idea of who you are on the line today. And so take a second and select which of these roles uh, or primary area of focus uh, you fill within your organization. And this is you personally. So are you the IT person? Are you doing operations, finance? I didn't put every role that there could possibly be on here. Are you the decision maker? Are you an executive or board member? Are you managing your marketing or communications, fundraising? Uh, maybe you work at the circulation desk, or you do intake or direct service delivery. Um, or you know, like many of us in nonprofit life, maybe you wear many hats. And again, select which most, most applies to your role. And this just helps us get an idea of who you are, because no matter where you sit within an organization, you have a role to play in helping ensure that your organization is prepared and has thought about your IT and your technical resources and how they can stand up to a disaster of any kind and how you can use them and leverage them to respond more appropriately. So let's go ahead and show the results on this one. It looks like 30% are IT today, so that's great. And followed pretty closely by 20%, almost 21% who wear many hats in the organization, not atypical. And then we've got another big group of more operations admin folks, and another big group of decision makers on the leadership and executive side. So that's helpful. So Thanks for chiming in on that, and I'll let Lars Eric take it back away. Thank you. Uh, and by the way, I think I forgot to mention that um, Eden 9 r and the 2 and 1s are all nonprofits. You know, so we basically are here to serve the community, which is an emphasis on focusing on the community. So because disaster preparedness, IT or otherwise, is often other duties assigned, it's one of the many hats you often wear. Um, my prior job, I actually had no fewer than three job titles. So some of the resources that we can basically make available for you guys, if you go to Eden 9R, you'll actually see some information that will be listed there. I'm going to be having some more links at the end. I also want to point you guys to the really wonderful um, IT disaster plan and recovery that TechSoup has prepared. Um, in fact, CARD, um, the agency I used to work for, was um, involved in the initial drafts of that. Um, I think you're on the third draft now. Um, anyway, so these, these, this is going to be all about resources. Now here's the really critical thing about this. Um, whenever you're approaching a conversation, because you guys are probably going to need to go back and basically encourage people to take some of these steps, it's extremely important to make sure that you don't talk in a way that even begins to sound threatening or intimidating or overwhelming. And talking about disasters this way, I'm talking about technology. A lot of people actually find technology to be extremely scary as well. So it's kind of funny how information technology and technology and preparedness for disasters can really overlap. So you know, I'm not going to go into this slide in too much detail, except just keep in mind that a lot of this is about looking at this in a really positive and empowering way, how to make good decisions under stress, and how to actually have fun with this to build an empowered team back where you're at. A lot of the approach that I, um, um, we like to advocate for, that CARD offered and that I offer in the trainings that I do, is what we like to call a culture of preparedness. It's basically making sure that it's just your way of being. It's not something that you think about only at special meetings. It's actually something you kind of build into your everyday culture via things like signage, via things like taking a preparedness moment at the beginning of staff meetings, uh, via things like actually making preparedness um, part of your uh, new employee orientation, you know, making sure that they actually sign into the technology that you guys have in certain ways so you can recover easily. So it's the same thing. It's really culture of technology as well, especially since it's now become really permeated in almost every single aspect. And do keep in mind that a lot of this stuff has actually changed. Um, you know, things have changed a lot from the way they were in the old days. If you've been watching any of the older TV shows or older movies, like my youngest daughter is, it's kind of uh, remarkable. They're trying to figure out what things like VHS tapes are. You know, what's a, VH, what's a VCR? So let's talk a little bit about what mobile technology is. It's basically anything that isn't nailed down. And that cuts across all ages, all populations, and all demographics. I mean, young children, um, people who actually aren't even high income often still are, are very dependent on technology. And here's a really important thing to kind of find out when you're talking about embracing technology for empowering your outreach and your resilience. It's something that they call the law of diffusion of innovation. You basically will have folks who are at the end of the curve, at the top of the curve, what they sometimes like to call the bleeding edge. They're the innovators, the people who adopt the new things as soon as they come out. Then you have your early adopters. 
And then you tend to have a lot of folks who tend to get on the board when things become more common. So like when iPads first came out, you had some people who got into that very initially, and then it became very ubiquitous. Uh, then you have the laggards, and then you have the people who are consistently against virtually everything. Folks that basically are still unhappy that we don't still have rotary phones, for example. And you know, it's actually important to have folks that uh, are on this end of the spectrum because you don't want to just do change just for the sake of change. So I'd like you guys to take a moment and basically indicate right now on the via the poll where you feel you are on this curve. And it's entirely okay to be honest. There's no judgment here. It's judgment-free room. Uh, you know, we just want to get an idea of kind of where you fall because oftentimes because of limited budgets, limited resources, limited time, limited staff expertise, uh, particularly in smaller organizations, uh, it can be really tough to get on the bandwagon and, and adopt some of the newer technologies. So uh, that's not excuses, but that's just saying there are some really legitimate reasons to sometimes be in the the late majority or be a laggard or maybe be resistant to some of those changes. So uh, you know, we want to give credit where due that it is useful to have kind of everyone across the spectrum. But we're going to talk about some of the technologies that can help you that might already be in your pocket, might be something you're already carrying around with you that can help you better secure and and help your organization be more resilient and stable in a disaster. So I'm going to go ahead and skip to the results so everyone can see. Um, got a lot of early majority people in this group, and pretty close to even on early adopter and late majority. I consider myself a, an early adopter, sometimes early majority. So good, good. Great. Okay, thank you. And that makes perfect sense. That's why it is a bell curve after all. Okay, so getting into the meat and potatoes of this now. I mean, it's really important. I spent a few moments talking about the framing, talking about you know what E9R is and why it's important to have a positive framework for this. But now some of the uh, down and dirty details. Um, when I worked for Dance Development, our motto was to go forward, you must back up. And I've seen over the years a lot of changes in how backups happened. You know, ranging from tape-based backup systems to, I mean, now cloud-based is much more. But here are the really, really key important points. Um, to have a good backup, it's fairly important that they, be, they need to be automated, they need to be monitored, they absolutely must be redundant, and it's very important to decide into being redundant that they are rotated. So automated because if it has to be manually run, if somebody's sick or not there, it doesn't happen. Monitored, a thing I often would see happen is that people would forget about their automatic backups and not realize that some kind of a problem existed. It's very, very important to have multiple copies, um, and we'll talk a moment about how it's important to have those off-site. So these are really, really the four criteria. So please come back to this when evaluating your own backups. Um, I like to think of this, and just note that when you guys go looking at the wonderful resilient organization from TechSoup, um, the terminology I'm using here is a little bit more based on the type of thing that you'll hear in consumer-based products. So my terminology is a tiny bit different um, than what you're going to be seeing when you go to that guide, but it's, based, it's highly analogous. Um, so Holy Trinity Backups this is a backup strategy I use myself. Um, there are version backups. Um, and these are usually provided by either incremental or differential backups where you basically recopy only the files that have changed, and you have access to files um, over time. Bootable backups. This is especially important for critical machines, like your accounting machines, or your um, machines that provide the databases for your essential services, something you can basically plug in somewhere else and get up and running very quickly. And then, of course, it's highly, highly critical to have backups that are stored far away from where you currently are in case you had to relocate. So version backups basically allows you to have copies of your files at many points in time. And some of the things it protects against are also things like file corruption or user error can also get that earlier version of your novel if you don't like the changes you made. These are most commonly done in some kind of external hard drive. It's not recommended to do internal drives or a stack of CDs. And this kind of thing should be at least once a day. And a lot of people will have their incremental backups run you know, several times a day or hourly. A lot of the automatic software that's included with Windows or OS X, in fact, do precisely that. Four, bootable backups, sometimes also known as a clone. Um, it's basically the exact copy of your startup disk that you can boot up from right away even at a different machine. This kind of thing actually requires specialized software. It's not something that you can actually do just by dragging files off to an external hard drive. You should definitely run these kinds of things minimum once a week, and I frankly prefer daily. 
Um, also, it's the type of thing that you should do before you do any kind of a major upgrade, such as going to a new version of the operating system. Um, and this type of thing often, you know, having multiple drives that you rotate off-site can be important for your especially critical machines. You might not do this for your everyday workstations, but for your really critical services machines, multiple drives that get rotated, highly, highly critical. Now we've talked a lot about already about having rotating backups. Um, it's something that's stored far away. And I kind of combine both cloud or physical in the same category. Um, some people actually like to have these two separate categories, but to my mind, is, is off-site is in fact off-site. And the whole idea here is that you have protection from your local catastrophes, such as a fire in your building that perhaps destroys all of your hardware. Um, it's fairly important to um, have this in a secure location, so make sure you're using a secure cloud backup service, whatever that might be. Um, and if you're doing rotating uh, drives or rotating media, back in the old days people used to do uh, tape backups, for example, please keep these in ideal storage conditions, i.e. make sure they're secure and not in places that are hot, cold, wet, etc. Um, depending on how secure your location is, consider using encryption as well. It's actually a really good idea to make sure that these types of things um, aren't um, too easily gotten to if something should happen to one of your uh, media, especially if it's being in, tra in transport. Um, a great time to verify your backup, um, this is a little bit of a, uh, a joke among IT folks, is that every Friday the 13th is a great time to verify your backup. What you can do is re try restoring a few files to confirm that the backups are actually working. And by the way, when you choose backup software, it's really, really important, I'd say, to make sure that your backup software includes some kind of a verification pass anyway. It's also a fantastic time to try making sure you can do a test boot from your bootable duplicate, either um, not just from your own machine, but perhaps an alternate machine, so you can establish things off-site. I do know for a fact that um, the Alameda County Community Food Bank does a strategy very much like this, where they actually have off-site backup drives and off-site machines that are already pre-installed with the software they would use, and they could actually therefore function you know, from a remote location if their machines aren't available on-site. So I went through this pretty quickly, but this can be a very, very big topic. So I just want to do a fast pause and take a look and see if there are any kind of questions or comments. Sure, yeah. We had one question from Meg asking, should you keep versioned backups of your bootable backups? Um, so what I do personally is I keep these separately. I have one hard drive. Um, I'm, a, I'm a Mac user. So I have a hard drive that's fairly large that I use Time Machine. And that's my versioned backup. I have a second hard drive that's pretty much the same size as my uh, computer's hard drive, and that's my bootable backup. So my bootable backup basically is a hard drive that I could then pick up and walk with and take that to another machine um, to boot off of. Or there have been uh, two occasions now where my personal machine suddenly went bad and I had to reformat the hard drive, but I didn't have time to reformat the hard drive and restore because I had to get work done. So I booted off the bootable backup did my work for that day, and when the weekend came, I was able to then fix my machine and, and, and get running again. Great. So I actually recommend yeah, separating. We have a couple of other questions that are just coming in on backup too. Mm -hmm. uh, Debbie asks, what software do you use for bootable backup? Is there anything that's free? Um, I don't know of anything that's, that's particularly free right now. I'm actually in the process of doing a reassessment of backup software. I personally use something called Data Backup, which is done by ProSoft. Um, you're not going to see that in this deck yet because I want to verify that they're still kind of up to date, and I'll be doing like a sort of a follow-up on on this to see uh, how they are. But the re one reason I chose them is because they're cross-platform. They have both Windows and Mac versions, um, and they were very highly, highly regarded. Um, I think one reason I want to do a reassessment though is I've been finding that their interface is a little denser than I think the average end user would like to do. Um, so I'm doing a bit of an assessment on that, but there's that retrospect is still around. That's the software company I worked for. They're a little bit high end, but if you're backing up like groups of machines, like a small work group, they're still a great way to go. Great. And we do have other questions coming in on backup, but I do want to be conscientious of time, so we yes. may try to get back to some of those. Yeah. But one thing I chatted out that you know, TechSoup really helps to try to promote in our guide um, on disaster planning and recovery in the backup section is the 2 by 2 by 2 rule. To try and keep it really simple and think about having two copies, so whether it's you know, one on site and one that's backed up someplace else that at least two people can access. So two copies, two people, um, and two different locations. So maybe you have an on site server. Maybe you have something that's being backed up in the cloud. Um, you know, you're using a box.org account to back up files or something like that. So 
two by two by two is a simple way to remember and to make sure that you're duplicating and those efforts, <laughs> that you're not having just one person who can access it, or one location that it's accessible, or only one copy. You've got to have two by two by two. Yes. hope that helps as we move yes. forward. As a matter of fact, you'll notice I'm going back to that one slide. I actually talk about the redundant. So two by two by two is a great example of being redundant, the Department of Redundancy Department. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's highly, 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 highly critical. I, I, I absolutely 100% agree with that. So. Okay, and we'll go ahead and take some more questions. And just know too, I'd be more than happy to answer a lot of these questions you know, via email and such as well. Okay, second part of technology is communications. Um, it's been shown that in disasters, I mean it's just, it's just absolutely clear that in disasters it's really, really, really important to be able to um, communicate. Um, it's, it's usually people's top concerns. Um, and a lot of the thing that we found is you, people are going to basically communicate using the methods that they're already accustomed to using. So something that's going to be available soon, we're in the process of reworking E9R's disaster resources page. Um, but right, we're going to be putting up a series that we used to call potty posters. That was a thing that CARD did, where you basically placed information about safety and preparedness anywhere you had a captive audience. And one of them was about this program, your cell phone initiative. This was a very, very popular initiative. All the things that you can do that make your portable personal technology into awesome, awesome preparedness tools. Something I would like to actually ask you guys to do after today's training, like right after the fact, is to go ahead and take at least one of these actions that you will see. Um, ICE. This is something that's been promoted for quite some time, you know, creating in case of emergency contacts on your phone. And that used to be for uh, people who picked up your phone if you were unconscious, if they could access your phone, would be able to look this up. And even on a locked phone, it's interesting, even on a locked phone, you can sometimes convince Siri or one of the other things to bring up these contacts anyway. Um, so there's actually ways of making these contacts still accessible even on locked phones. But it's also very, very handy because under stress, you might have trouble remembering your own phone num these own phone numbers. Your, your brain under stress, things just really start to go out the window. And just making sure you've got all your um, friends, families, and neighbors, and doctors, hospitals, and medica medical conditions, daycare providers, locations of rally points. Having that stuff already on your phone means it's pretty much always with you because you tend to always have your phone with you. Over here on the right side, you'll actually see an example of a little initiative that we had done. I'd like to see this picked up again. There were little sized pads the size of bookmarks that are very low cost to print out and very, very easy to distribute. It was really successful. People really like this sort of program. Um, something else I'd like you to do, especially if you have smartphones, and many, many people do nowadays, Oops, trying to get to the other side, is on smartphones, having photographs and important documents and first aid and CPR apps, you know, anything that will help you remember the things that you need to know how to do. So smartphones are actually can be awesome preparedness tools. It means that your phone is actually useful even if you don't actually have cell phone reception. Now, another really important thing to keep in mind is that if you're going to be using technology, you're going to have to be able to make sure that your technology still has power. So I want to talk, make sure I briefly talk about how you make sure that your personal technology still actually has power available to it. And there's a plethora of products. I double checked this. It's funny, the first time I did this webinar back in 2015, this was a URL that gave a nice rundown of some of the best portable battery chargers you could buy. I did a fast check, and this article is still up to date as of February of this year. So they actually are constantly reassessing this. So please use it as a resource to get a sense of some of these products, which I've noticed tend to have very quixotic and unique names. You know, they tend to have names like uh, Oxa and Sintar and you know, Morphe Case and so forth. I mean, you name it. Uh, it's quite fascinating the names they did use. Um, a power case for your phone is a great way to go because you just flip the switch and you're good to go, and it's actually a part of your phone. Car adapters. Highly, highly, highly recommend having car adapters. A habit to please adopt. Um, making sure that you basically plug your phone in whenever you drive. It's not too dissimilar from the advice you often hear about making sure you always have at least a half a tank of gas. Another habit is give your friends car chargers as gifts, because that way when you're riding in their car, you'll know they have a car charger. It's a little bit of self-interest, but it's, just, it's a great thing. Um, also, you'll see here, these are examples of pocket-sized keychain batteries 
that are great stocking stuffers, and they're great for getting, giving your phone a single charge. And sometimes that's all you need. Um, Becky mentioned earlier examples of emergencies is very broad. This actually got me through a uh, commencement ceremony at a university when my phone um, was low on power, and the emergency is I still need to be able to take photos. And this little guy right here helped me be able to take photos of my daughter's graduation. Oops, sorry, there was a little calcitrant there in the slides. Okay. Also keep in mind, especially for your higher technology, last time I was at REI, the solar power chargers are really dropping in price. And the part of me that wants to camp in order to get away from technology is sort of like, no, no, no. But the part of me that wants to make sure I can still be up and in an emergency really likes this stuff. Um, and it's actually amazing how much you can run off of some of these guys. And the costs are dropping. So this could be a cost-effective way for an agency to make sure that they have a couple of pieces of technology that still work. So that's about our power. Um, and I just want to take a fast look about contents. Yes, you do privacy security with information on the phone. Yeah, having stuff that's locked on your phone, if, if having, keeping your phone locked is highly, highly recommended. But most phones have an app or a way of still being able to bring up an emergency contacts um, only so that you don't end up having all of your other information uh, not being secure. So that was a really good question. Okay, so in an emergency, we're still talking communications. Besides having your technology, we're talking about social media. So there are several kinds of social media. Um, the thing that I've noticed recently is with Twitter. Um, it's one of the things that public information officers now tend to use um, in order to get news out quickly. I actually saw this recently with the um, recent um, floods that we were having here in the Bay Area here in California. Um, if you went to certain web pages for certain uh, uh, organizations, the, what was there was an embedded Twitter feed. And they were basically posting their updates via Twitter. This is often a great way to actually kind of keep your finger on the pulse. I've often found, for example, that cases of civil unrest um, uh, following my local public transportation was the fastest way to find out something that was going on because you would see things about how um, certain stations are closed due, in, due to an incident. So it's been used in a large number of things. So Twitter really is actually a very useful tool for staying abreast of situations. And it's something that a lot of agencies actually use. Facebook is not a bad way to stay in touch. In fact, I actually had a colleague who was on a trip to Japan a number of years ago, and everything was going great. And then they had an earthquake, followed by a tsunami, followed by a reactor meltdown. And we started panicking because we didn't know if he was okay. And it turned out he was. And the way we found out was via Facebook. So the way that you can basically let your loved ones know, or some organizations will do this uh, as well, they'll actually set up a specialized page that they then let other people know is going to be their page to give them reports on their status. I've known that several daycare centers that do this, for example. You know, some libraries and several food banks do exactly this. It's also a great way to engage with agencies prior to the disaster so that you actually know what kinds of plans are in place. And tied into that is LinkedIn. LinkedIn is really all about professional connections. And something I found in over the years as I've done trainings is that a lot of emergency preparedness is really about relationships. Having relationships in place is infinitely more valuable than having detailed plans that people actually then forget about. In fact, there was actually a really great quote in the Disaster Resiliency Guide about how you need to make sure that all the staff members know about your plan. Don't let them forget about its existence. And this kind of thing is a way of making sure that you're actually staying connected to folks who'd be able to help you out in disaster. Um, just to give you an example, this was actually a real-world response for a number of years ago for Occupy o Oakland. You'll see on the one side, this is a little tool called Twitterfall, which is a way of monitoring tweets to see exactly what's kind of happening. And over here is Hootsuite, which was allowing um, easily posting to multiple platforms. So it's actually a great way for an agency to be able to post simultaneously to Twitter, to Facebook, to LinkedIn, so that whoever is following you is likely to be able to see your postings, and it makes it a, a, a possible with a lot less effort. OK, next, in the world of preparedness, and I'm going to go through this fairly quickly because this is really just sort of to give an indication of the kinds of things that you can have on your technology. 
because there's an app for that. There's all kinds of preparedness apps or apps that can help you out. I should point out that a lot of these apps are apps that I either have used or are currently using, although I think a few may be getting supplanted. But this is really just to give you ideas of the types of apps that you want to look for. Um, and if any of you guys find apps that you guys prefer um, to anything that's suggested here or an app that you found really useful, i please love it if you guys would share that either in the chat or post uh, this event you know, by contacting. Here is, so we see this pretty fast, Nixel. Come on up, Nixel. There you go. So Nixel is a service that allows um, various agencies, a lot of law enforcement, some fire services, to post to the community. Um, many communities actually have their own alert systems. Here in Alameda County, for example, we have something called AC Alert, which is very similar to Nixel, although it's not precisely Nixel. So in addition to installing Nixel and then following things, make sure that you also know about any kind of um, local mass notification systems that you may have in your area. Pretty much everybody has something like that. Similarly, transit information. So here in the Bay Area, we have something called 511. It's a transit planner. It actually allows you to know what things are up or, or what things are up or down. They tend to follow the major lines, so the back roads won't necessarily be covered by that. Great way to keep, find out how transit is going, however. Weather, knowing what the weather is all about, what the weather is like. I know there's some areas of the country where you want to make sure that you know all about your tornado alerts and your storm alerts. Group Me is something that I recently used um, until I found out that it was just as easy for me to just maintain an alive, active texting group. But you know, things like Group Me or WhatsApp, which is probably superseding Group Me in popularity nowadays, is a great way to maintain groups of folks in a text group. And what's nice about these is that people can uh, a bit more easily opt in or opt out. Flipboard is a news aggregator. This is actually a great way to keep track of um, various kinds of news. So you, every everyday life you may actually follow things like tech or news or Twitter you know, or uh, uh, various Facebook feeds of various agencies. Um, and it's actually a very nice way to actually see things in one place without having to go around too far. Having some kind of cloud-based storage. This kind of ties into backup plans. You know, if you're actually off-site and have to access files, having something like a specialized Dropbox you know, or a OneDrive or Google Drive account that every, every people can handle. You know, some of these uh, utilities also integrate extremely well with other apps. So you can actually bring up your uh, um, Excel documents or Word documents. A topic that is kind of near and dear to my heart, something I can talk about extensively, and I believe actually TechSoup is having a cybersecurity webinar coming up soon. And I also am quite sure you guys have some in your archives. But you know, I personally have used 1Password to maintain passwords. And what's nice about uh, utilities like this is you can actually maintain groups of passwords. You can actually store these vaults on your cloud drive so that other people could access them. And you can keep your personal passwords in separate vaults from the passwords that you're sharing with the people at your agency. And this could be super, super, super critically important you know, because uh, a lot of agencies will actually have um, details in place on how to maintain their servers, how to maintain their email, how to maintain their databases. But without the passwords, it would be very hard to get yourself off the ground. And again, the uh, resilient organization talks a lot about that uh, in a general way. This is one really specific example of a tool that you can use that integrates very well and it's very cross-platform. They have Windows versions, OXX versions, and they have versions that run on your um, portable devices. So I also have this on my iPad and my iPhone. And I absolutely swear by this. Apps about first aid. Apps that allow you to track um, uh, public police channels. Apps allow you to make recordings, audio recordings. Come on, you can do it. Here we go. Um, actually making an audio recording that you can then play back so you can say the same thing over and over again can be a great way to guide people to a certain location. There is a topic called the Incident Command System, and there is an app for that. Incident Command System is um, something that was developed in fire servers, the way of organizing in an emergency. Even apps that might seem initially silly, like iBanner, uh, I this is a way you could actually make a large message that you can then hold up and display. Um, I actually have seen this used, especially in the deaf, hard of hearing community. But even if you're not deaf, hard of hearing, just having a way of being giving people instructions. CPR, triage, you know, things that basically help you remember the, what you should be actually doing medically. And then, of course, communications, things like Skype, and there's other um, 
utilities like uh, NextLine. There we go. And even things that make noise on your machine, being able to make loud noises to get people's attention can be a very way, a good way to go. So some of these apps might seem initially silly. You, what I'd encourage you to do is kind of think outside the box and think about how you guys might want to use these. Now here's an example that I think is a bit out of date, but I haven't been able to find what's happened since Jibogo has been acquired by Facebook. But the thing that's nice about this kind of translator as opposed to Google Translate is that it also works when you're offline, when you don't have an internet connection. And the reason I left this in is just because I, it was just a reminder that when you have apps, it's actually a really good way to see um, if your apps function in the absence of some kind of connection. So you should actually test that. Turn off your cell, turn off your Wi-Fi on your iPhone or your Android phone, and see which apps, how well they still work. Um, a lot of these things will actually work quite well because they're local to the phone. So this is all about being easy. So the question that I'd like you guys to do here is I'd like you to basically post in the chat, and I think this will actually get mentioned a bit later as well, just a single easy action you'll take. And I know I went through a lot of stuff very, very quickly, but um, some, one, a couple of these things probably leap out at you. So take a moment, and I'm going to continue talking a little bit as I wrap things up. But while I'm doing that, please do post in the chat one simple easy action that you will take on personally or that you will recommend that your agency take on. All right. Places you can go for resources. So we are in the process of updating the page, but on our webpage, EdenIR.org, you know, two on one disasters emergencies, there's some information there right now that talks about our role in disasters, you know, and how we would be accessible to help people out. TechSoup also has this wonderful, wonderful guide called the Resilient Organization Guide to IT Disaster Planning Recovery. I'm very proud to say that the agency I used to work for, CARD, was quite involved in the first drafts of that, and it's invaluable advice. A lot of the advice I gave here dovetails with that. It's just that right now what I was doing is a little bit more oriented towards the consumer end, you know, towards you know, folks that are not IT specialists. But um, if you're at all involved in IT in any way, shape, or form, you will find this absolutely invaluable. Uh, and even if you're not an IT person. Um, just so you guys have a bit of biography, you know, um, take control of backing up your Mac, and despite the title, it's actually not difficult to generalize advice. It's a great example of an e-book that's available for, I think it's like 10 or $15. And a lot of my backup strategies came from that. There's also a book from a long time ago called The Complete Guide to Backup Management. And much of my time back in advanced development when we did backup software came from this approach. A lot of it had to do with identifying your critical machines, testing your backups, you know, knowing where things physically are located, et cetera. Another quick resource, I'm not going to spend much time on this, but this is also the fact that you know, trainings. If you guys are interested in presenting this information to an audience and you need advice on that, or if you guys are in the, or near the Bay Area and you'd like um, something a little more in person, I can be located. Um, and I'd also like to encourage you guys to check out our page to find out more about these really positive empowered trainings because it's really a very different kind of approach to disaster preparedness that's actually more sustainable. Um, here is my contact information. So please do download this deck and, and feel free to check how I, uh, things are on social media. And more importantly, you know, feel free to give me a call or drop me an email. You know, from the generous support of the Walter and Elise Haas Fund, we're actually able to proudly present this curriculum that was developed by nonprofits and for nonprofits to help nonprofits and community-based organizations make sure they sure that they stay strong and resilient. Please also do feel free to connect to Eden INR via any of our uh, various and sundry methods because you know we are here to help serve you and also do go if you go to 211.org that will help you easily locate the agency that provides 211 services um, for your area and that's it for me wow thank you so much lars eric that was so much really great information i know we covered a lot but i know that there are some great resources that you'll be able to refer to in this slide deck. Um, I have this one screen up before we get to some Q&A just to let you know that on that disaster planning and recovery page that we have for TechSoup, you can download our full guide that goes in-depth, gives recommendations of different products available, uh, different 
processes. So it's really a terrific resource that you could print out and give to an IT person whether they are on staff or contracted with you. And they could help ensure that you've got the resources you need technologically to help you better prepare and respond. Uh, these are a few that are highlighted on the page that exists within TechSoup's donation program. Mobile Beacon, these are hotspots that are wireless. So for example, if you are uh, cable internet went down for some reason, you may be able to access internet with a mobile beacon hotspot. And you can order these in bundles that allow you to access up to 10 of them. So you could loan them out. For example, if you uh, are at a library and people lose their internet because of a disaster, you could offer a checkout program that people could have wireless internet um, available to them with your mobile hotspot loaner program. Um, Microsoft has a variety of desktop installed and cloud op options available including storage uh, online with their OneDrive. Um, so a lot of different options there where you can have uh, backup both on your desktop machines and online. We have Box.org donations. So I know Lars Eric mentioned Dropbox earlier. Box is a very similar type cloud file storage and sharing programs. So you could have an online backup if you don't already. Even if you do, for, some, for example, somebody asked about Google Docs and most of, their, most of their materials are created and shared in the cloud already. And what happens if Google servers goes down? Well, Google has, has uh, server farms all over the world, and they duplicate those and back those up. So in a lot of ways you are better protected than if you had just your own servers on site. But you may want to have some of those uh, files backed up on an external hard drive on site. You might also want to have them backed up on a different cloud platform because in case something catastrophic happened at a Google server farm, you may find that you are unable to access stuff for a few hours until one of the other server farms takes over. So that's just something to think about. Also, lots of hardware options available through TechSoup's catalog including things like switches and routers, and sometimes we have external hard drives um, and other hardware resources to help you ensure that you are secure and backed up. Um, and then Better World Telecom is another program that we offer that gives access to um, mobile devices, uh, cell phones, things like that if you need access to um, more options in that regard. And then I'll mention this recovery tool from Caravan Studios which is a project of TechSoup's um, where they have a mobile app that they've created that helps make it easy to deploy volunteers and gives time-sensitive tasks to them to help organize people in an emergency very quickly. So for example, if you actually have a response uh, directly to a disaster, you could use the Four Bells app to help coordinate your volunteer response. So those are just a few resources. And now I'm going to get to some questions. We have a variety of questions in here. Um, I'll take Margaret's first because I think this is a good question for a lot of different organizations, not just the small library she represents. But she said, are there good basic guidelines for setting up a backup system for a very small library or any very small organization? Maybe you don't have an IT person on staff. What would you recommend for that, Lars Eric? You know, and I realize it looked very Mac-centric, but that backup guide that I talked about, that Jill, his name is Jill Kissel, and he's a very practical guy. And really, even though it says you know, uh, your guide for backups, a lot of that advice is really very generalized. I mean, that's what, part of where I got the idea of threes, you know, the idea of having like three redundant backups. That also dates back to my days of dance when you wanted to make sure that you um, never had all your backups in transit. You know. um, so that's a, that's a common one. I'm also still doing a little bit more research on this. Um, to find out which other resources are really good for guiding that. But right now, um, if you check out, it's um, Take Control Books. So if you look at Take Control on the, on, uh, on the web, they actually have a whole series of topics which despite starting off as being very Macintosh-centric and OSX-centric, um, is actually very uh, widely applicable, especially the information regarding backups and the information regarding passwords. Great. Thank you for that. And you know, we do have a lot in that disaster planning guide as well that gives some step-by-step -step advice on how to get started with setting up backups. Yes. Um, Terry asked, is there a checklist that I could use with our IT company to go over all of this information? Something like here are the five things you need to have done to get your backup and your, your disaster prep in line. Do you know of anything like that? 
Yeah, checklists are marvelous. One of our favorite books was The Checklist Manifesto by Dr. Atul Gawande. Now, it's funny you should say that because when I was looking at the new um, disaster, the new Resilient Organization Resource Planning Guide from you guys, I mean, a lot of the pages are, okay, so they're kind of like you know, uh, grids or, or spreadsheets, but they're very checklist-like. So for example, I'm looking at your technologies priorities assessment or your key recovery staff. You know, it's basically a, a, a box that you would actually fill in you know, to basically make sure that you actually have your contact information in a central place that you could do stuff. So I actually would start with uh, TechSoup's own guide for that because it's very you know, checklist-like. We didn't even plan that, and I was of course going to mention our own guide as well yeah. <laughs> because yeah. I do think it has a lot of that kind of good resource in it in the way it's laid out. But I thought if there was anything else, I would leave it to you. But thank you for the uh, pitch to our, our own guide that we just created again. Yeah, well, right now um, I, think that's I do my think favorite. it's a really great guide. Yeah, yeah. So mutual, mutual love and admiration here. Great. <laughs> thank you. Um, Anne asks, do you have any sample disaster recovery plans around IT? Um, yes. Let me think about this if there's anything I can release because I'd have to redact some stuff. Um, although I'll actually say this, you know, based on what I've been seeing from the guide, I want to actually um, um, modify some of that a bit. Um, what I actually have are continuity of operations plans for groups of, uh, for a group of East Bay or, or organizations that really ran the gamut from being food banks to being faith-based organizations that were going to be shelters, you know, to being crisis support services, you know, to you name it. And it was really quite fascinating how the continuity of operations differed really quite widely based on, on the type of organization they were and their size. Um, and they all had some kind of an IT component. So it will be a little bit of time before I can offer that in a template kind of form because um, it was something I was working on um, and then got sidetracked and had to focus on the trainings that I needed to do. Um, but yes, there are some things like that, so I'll try to make sure those are available and go up on um, the disaster page that EDINR is, going, is, is, re, is reworking. Great, great, and that's good that that's coming. Um, one last question. I know that there are a couple others that we haven't been able to get to, but we do need to start wrapping up. But you know, Debbie asks, do you have contacts or recommendations of people who can do similar presentations to this one in different places around the country? She's act asking specifically about Vermont. But if somebody wanted to do something like this for their staff or for an organization of organizations or an association, um, are there resources on, that you can connect people to, or is there a place where people can find um, you know, presenters like you that can talk about disaster prep and recovery? Yeah, it's hard though because it's kind of scattered. The approach that CARD was taking was pretty unique. And it was funny because while CARD existed, we actually, even though we were initially uh, created to focus in Alameda County, we ended up going all across the country. Um, you know, so my uh, boss often went to places on the East Coast and such. Um, let me do a little bit of looking, for example, just to I'll start with Vermont as a specific example and see if there's folks like that. Um, barring that, and I'd have to check with a few folks here to see how much of that I'd be able to do under um, the funding that supports me. Um, but I could totally see maybe the possibility of me doing like a uh, assessed, you know, customized version of this webinar for you guys, you know. That's, that's something I'd be willing to do if, if, I, if I can do that. So you know, reach out yeah. to me via the email. Um, yeah, because we're at kind of a different point. And a lot of people have been adopting the approach. You know, also go ahead and try and give your local 211 a call you know, and see if they, they, they have that in their resource database. Yeah, and you know, I imagine that there are groups that do, um, any kind of groups that do disaster response and recovery yeah. um, may have connections to people that could do it specifically around the technology. I mean, Precisely. I can imagine Red Cross and, and places that specifically do disaster response may be able to point you in the direction of other experts too. Yeah, although I, I do know that here in the Bay Area anyway, Red Cross unfortunately um, had to cut back on the trainings they can offer. Um, but yeah, and you, it, you know, if you started off with like, it, it, it's a funny thing. IT people have kind of a disaster mindset. It's one reason why people who are in information technology are often the people that get to wear that other hat. Because as you pointed out at the beginning of, of the webinar, you know, the definition of disaster could be your server room flooded. You know, and I've noticed that IT people in general tend to be pretty resourceful with things like, gee, we have no diapers, you know, or gee, you know, my camera's not quite working, and they know how to MacGyver stuff. Um, so you also might want to check with like your local you know user groups because those are yeah that's a great idea the box. 
Great yeah. idea. Well, as we wrap up here at the top of the hour, I would love it if uh, – I know many of you chatted in one thing that you learned already, but if you have other things you'd want to chat in to let us know what you learned. We always find that really inspiring to read after the fact, the things that you are going to take away and try to implement for your own organization's needs. We would also invite you to share this content with your colleagues and friends who may benefit from it. And we would ask that you complete the post-event survey that pops up when you exit the webinar. We'd also like to enjoy, invite you to join us on our new TechSoup Courses platform where you can see our full catalog of free and some low-cost uh, trainings. And these are 24-7, not a specific time of the day where you can log in. Uh, it's just like getting a library card. Once you've logged in, you can access all of the different trainings that are available in the catalog and check out what's there. Um, we have everything from design for non-designers and how to do, use Adobe Photoshop 101 to how to train your, tech, uh, train your staff on using technology and all, all kinds of other topics. And we're adding to it all the time. So please join us there. And Lars, Eric mentioned that we have an upcoming webinar on uh, cybersecurity. So I'd like to invite you to join us for any of our upcoming events. Next week we'll be talking about the different technology hardware donations available through TechSoup's programs. We'll talk about nonprofit security best practices. Are they out to get you? Of course they are, and we want to help prevent them from getting your information. Um, we also will talk about how nonprofits can stay and be compliant while using Microsoft's cloud. We can, we'll also be talking about uh, digital storytelling for libraries. And then coming into May, we'll have a whole series of grant-seeking webinars. And I don't have on here, but we'll have a series in our TechSoup Courses platform that I already linked to. We'll have a series of events uh, that are 30-minute long quick webinars with quick tips on using Adobe's suite of tools coming up in the next couple of weeks. So please join us for those. Thank you so much Lars, Eric. Thank you to Susan and Sarah on the back end. And thank you to all of you, our participants, for joining us for today's webinar and continuing to engage with your great questions. Thank you to uh, ReadyTalk, our webinar sponsor, who's provided the use of today's platform for our benefit. Please take a moment when you exit to complete that pop-up survey to let us know how we can continue to improve our webinar programming. Thank you everyone, and have a great day. Bye-bye.